from Colombia, we flew 2,600 miles south to Santiago de Chile. We split our stay between the historic center and the much newer northeast. Both the Vitacura and Las Condas neighborhoods are upscale and modern, the home of many expats and most embassies. Vitacura has some especially nice houses with walkable neighborhood streets, but security is always high on the list for design features. They also have some of the best views of the Andes Mountains rising to the east of the city, though Santiago's infamous smog frequently obscures them. Vitacura has a wonderful private museum, its collection primarily from modern Latin American artists. Modern art isn't usually our thing, but we loved many of the pieces, including Dialogue with the Iguana, this homage to one of our favorite artists, René Magritte, and the Dali-esque Tropic of Capricorn. But there was also an impressive collection of actual pieces by Salvador Dali, as well as one sculpture by French master Auguste Rodin. Las Condes is dominated by wide avenues and high-rise buildings, and it has the Urban Civic Cultural Center, where young Santiagans practice their K-pop dance moves. And just outside Las Condes, in Providencia, the Constanera Tower rises 300 meters, the tallest in South America. By contrast, the Central Historic District is older and grittier, with lots of graffiti-covered buildings. But it does have some beautiful buildings and wonderful walking streets. With fresh fruit and vegetable vendors and a small weekend farmer's market. A short walk away, Santiago's Central Market has a lot bigger selection. And if that's still not enough, there are two even bigger markets just to the north. Plaza de Armas is the center of old Santiago. As old as the city itself, it dates back to 1541 and was built over the heart of a previous Inca city following the Spanish conquest. It was the Chilean colonial center for commerce and government and is now a beautiful park. It's bordered by the Chilean post office, the Santiago Metropolitan Cathedral, and the National Museum of History. The cathedral was built atop the Inca temple, and after multiple fires and earthquakes, the current structure was built in the 19th century. The museum's permanent exhibit primarily concerns the 1814 war for Chilean independence against Spain. A temporary exhibit concerned the 50th anniversary of Chile's 1973 military coup, but that will be covered later in this video. Plaza de Armas also has a major metro station. Which is an easy and inexpensive way to move around Santiago. One line serves Vitacura and Las Condes, but four of the six lines are easily accessed from the center. The Belas Artes neighborhood is next to the historic center, with beautiful 19th century buildings and many bars and restaurants, including this cool place we found where you can get a fantastic pisco sour, one of Chile's national drinks. 
from Bellas Artes, it's easy to access Santiago's most prominent landmark, San Cristobal Hill. The funicular is at the southern base of the hill. We tried unsuccessfully to buy tickets online, but regular ticketing wasn't that bad. San Cristobal Hill has a lot of activities available, but one of the main draws is the Catholic Sanctuary, with its statue of the Virgin of the Immaculate Conception. The eastern base of the hill is accessed by the cable car, and we bought a combined one-way ticket. It's a long, leisurely ride with a great view, except for the thick layer of smog that we had to deal with that day. Our favorite neighborhood for the Santiago bar scene was Barrio Italia. We started out before 5 p.m., enjoying a few places with a lot of space to ourselves. But it didn't take long for the streets to fill up, which was time for us to move on. On September 11, 1973, the democratically elected president of Chile was overthrown in a coup supported and immediately recognized by the United States. The dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet lasted until 1990. 30,000 people were tortured and thousands executed. 2,000 of these were children. The Museum of Memory and Human Rights preserves the names and faces of the victims. Interviews with survivors are shown, and heroes like the women who protested despite aggressive intimidation are immortalized. A touchscreen shows details of individual victims. Unlike countries that try to erase their dark periods from history, Chile drags theirs out into the open. The National History Museum exhibit marking the 50th anniversary of the coup adds an additional perspective. These shattered glasses, found the week after the coup and believed to belong to the assassinated President Allende, became a symbol for shattered democracy in Chile. This sculpture in the museum courtyard brings the symbolic glasses to the present day. Its plaque challenges visitors to view the past and democracy through their own lenses. Chile is the world's fifth largest wine exporter, and three wine regions are close to Santiago. We love Chilean wine, so of course we did a vineyard tour. Concha y Toro in the Maipo Valley is the largest producer in Latin America and top 10 in the world, and the Chilean brand that we know the best. Founded in 1883 by Don Melchor de Concha y Toro and his wife, but no longer owned by the family, the estate home is a Chilean national monument and the grounds are 22 hectares or 54 acres. The varietal garden shows visitors samples of all the grapes the company grows. Including a Vic's favorite, Sauvignon Blanc. Carmenere, originally from France, has become Chile's signature grape and more is grown here than in any other country. The new cellar is pretty impressive, but the original from 1883, El Casiero del Diablo, Devil's Cellar, comes with a dark, legendary past and dramatic presentation. off the tour with a wine pairing lunch, a highlight of our time in Santiago, but not the end of our time in Chile. So be sure to subscribe to see more of our Chilean explorations.